This video is sponsored by NordVPN. Science fiction and fantasy are subgenres of fiction where your imagination can go absolutely wild, where authors can dream up whatever unbelievable stuff they please, put it on paper, and have absolutely no one question it as long as it's internally consistent. However, there is one thing even the most imaginative authors usually can get away from, that is, having capitalism be their world's dominant economic system. No matter how wild and out there their fictional world is, if there is a modern or near-modern economic system, it will most likely be capitalism. Metoidarian! My tricks gonna work on me! Only money. This phenomenon is commonly referred to as capitalist realism. The unconscious acceptance that capitalism is the end of economic history, this is it, we've reached the final form of economics, there are no better alternatives. All we can do is make minor adjustments to perfect it. Therefore, even the wildest fictional world will obviously operate under capitalism because there's just no other way. You get the idea. But there is something else thanks to capitalist realism, just as pervasive yet rarely talked about. Namely, automobile realism. Our inability to imagine our lives, our cities, our world without cars. Now, don't get me wrong, cars can be very useful and in the countryside they will probably always be with us. However, the majority of the planet lives in cities, with the share of urban dwellers constantly increasing. And in cities, cars should not be necessary or even wanted for our everyday lives. In most major cities of most developed countries, it's already completely possible to live car-free. However, when streets are reconstructed or newly built, they still look like this. With the majority of space devoted to cars, despite drivers usually being the minority in the traffic mix. Gotta have space for those metal boxes. For the past couple of years though, an interesting phenomenon has been emerging. Young people are waiting longer and longer to get their driver's licenses, fewer of them actually end up getting it, and yet fewer will actually own a car. Why is this happening? Do young people just have different preferences? Have urbanists and planners succeeded in incentivizing the car-free lifestyle? Or is it just sheer economics? Does this all mean we're nearing the end of the automobile era? That's what we're going to find out after a healthy dose of internet realism. Isn't it weird how we've also taken granted the lack of privacy in the digital era? Like how your car will soon be taking DNA samples from you to be overlaid with a 5 trillion point behavioral model of you calculated by a supercomputer so that Amazon can recommend you the correct spatula. Well now, thanks to NordVPN, the sponsor of this video, you can keep yourself safe in this increasingly unsafe digital landscape. NordVPN's virtual private network service helps you stay anonymous on the internet, hides your physical location, and encrypts your personal data. Available both for Android, iOS, and PC, NordVPN is the number one VPN provider on the market. Its most popular feature is of course the elimination of region blocks. As someone living in Europe, I'm still doomed to use Emerald Boy's Bird app. But with NordVPN, I have access to sites like Instagram threads, where I register with a throwaway email address so that the Zuck won't be able to harvest my personal data in the process. I also find VPNs useful when using the Wi-Fi connection on board of trains, especially if there is some sort of limit on usage, not to mention potential privacy concerns. In addition to its virtual private network service, NordVPN also has a data breach scanner feature and a safe, encrypted online storage service called NordLocker. To get NordVPN's two-year plan plus four months free, use my link nordvpn.com slash adamsomething, which you will also find in the description. Subscribing is risk-free, as you will also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. Big thanks to NordVPN for sponsoring today's video. So, what is happening with young people to cause their declining demand for cars and driver's licenses? Is it just different preferences? Have they gone past automobile realism? Is it proper planning that incentivizes car-free lifestyle? Or is it just sheer economics? And what does this mean for the future? Up until the 21st century, getting a driver's license and buying a car were considered a rite of passage for young people, a symbol of true independence where they no longer had to rely on the mommy taxi to get to places. This idea was most prevalent in the US from the 1950s and 60s, especially in newly built car-centric suburbia. It's the image of 1970s cool kids zooming down the freeway in a convertible with disco music blaring, riding into the California sunset. This was the ideal anyway, but then the bills came in. Fuel, insurance, servicing, loan payments. Oh look, a traffic jam. Again. Sitting in your shiny car, stewing for two hours in traffic. Every single day. For the rest of your productive life doesn't sound so good, does it? Ever since we reached peak automobile, when literally everyone started driving everywhere, driving went from something cool and a symbol of freedom to a money sink and a chore. Also yet another cause for climate change. So are young people turning away from cars due to finding it a burden, a chore or even immoral? Well, there is merit to all of these. For example, statistically speaking, young people are more concerned with climate change, understandably so. They will have to live with the consequences after all, which we are starting to see already. Major fires all over the place, natural disasters, Florida is going underwater. There was even a tornado in the Czech Republic some time ago. It leveled the whole village. It was pretty terrifying. Meanwhile, at the Republican candidates debate, not only did most candidates not believe the existence or severity of climate change, evil Barack Obama without the charisma went further, acknowledged its existence and said it's actually a good thing. 
So it's understandable how some young people might look at all that and decide they don't want to contribute to this insanity, thereby opting for a car-free lifestyle. However, this cannot be the answer, or at least not the whole answer. If a commute takes half an hour by car and two hours by public transit, 99% of people will opt for the car. To live car-free, or at least to deprioritize it in your life, you'll need proper incentives, such as human-friendly urban planning. Cities where most things you need are within walking distance, easily accessible on foot, by bike, or quality public transit. This is how we used to build our cities, until our political elite caught the disease called car brain, and now everything has to be planned around metal boxes, because we, but mostly our leaders, cannot imagine our world without cars. Automobile realism in practice. However, a growing number of activists and even politicians are recognizing this problem and changes happening. Though places like the city of Havirov, Czech Republic, have adopted more unique approaches to keep up with the times. In front of this children's home, for example, where cars used to take up half the sidewalk, the leadership of Havirov decided to improve the area by turning the entire sidewalk into a parking lot, thereby gaining 11 new parking spaces, at the measly cost of having a hundred children walk on the road to school in active traffic. Czech Republic. Now you know a little bit what it's like. Will you come? <laughs> Meanwhile, in Western Europe, thankfully, politicians aren't usually trying to turn their cities into open-air parking lots. Even the US and Canada have had a number of positive examples recently. There are new bike lanes, transit lines, highway removals even. In many places, the trend is definitely positive. It seems like, at least in the developed world, we are past peak automobile. The hegemony of cars is slowly ending. That's not to say we cannot backslide, therefore we should always push for more positive changes. Even if we are 99% there, we must push for the remaining 1% all the same. Human-centric urban planning really does help help direct people, especially young people, from a car-centric lifestyle to a car-free one. As soon as roads aren't deadly for cyclists, for example, and there is quality, safe infrastructure for them, a lot of people will reconsider sitting inside a metal box and go car-free, or at least less car-centered, but many people still won't. Take Amsterdam, for example, the city with one of the best, if not the best, cycling infrastructure on the planet. If there is a city where it's possible to live car-free, it's Amsterdam. I think we can all agree, because we all watch not just bikes videos, but even in Amsterdam, many Many people just won't go car free. To quote the man himself, This is about the time the driving apologist will chime in claiming that all of these people have to drive because they have no other choice and need a car for some reason. Thankfully, the NRC actually stopped and asked people why they were driving into the city center. Were they all bringing their poor disabled mothers out to the canals for a sunny Sunday? No. They were just driving because that's what they felt like doing. One group said they were at the Amsterdam Rye Convention Center, a place with one of the best park and ride garages in the entire city, and a direct metro line that literally brings you right to this location within five minutes. Instead, they sat in traffic for an hour and a half to get here. There was only one guy they interviewed who really needed to drive because he was helping his son move into a new apartment. Of course, he had to sit in traffic that shouldn't have even been there if these people had just taken the metro like everyone else. So there, as long as it's possible to live a car-centric life, many people will just do it, defying common sense. The only thing left to influence their preferences is economics. Money. When young people refuse to drive, own a car, or even get a driver's license, changing preferences, environmental concerns, and better alternatives definitely play a role. However, at the end of the day, the biggest reason for young people going car-free is sheer economics. Even though cars didn't get that much more expensive, the cost of living is vastly higher, and salaries, especially for young people, are just not keeping up. Because of that, it's much harder to afford and maintain a car, so young people are naturally looking for alternatives. Some people might find this disappointing. The decrease is not due to a revelation by young people about the negative effects of mass motorization. Not only, anyway. At the end of the day, it's mostly just cold, hard finances. Instead of despairing, though, if you, like me, would like to see a less car-oriented future, we should use this momentum to get as far away from peak automobile as possible, to set these positive changes into stone by forcing our cities to adapt and rebuild along the car-free lifestyle instead of the car-centric one. In practice, this means always voting in local elections for the party that promises is the most human-friendly changes and that has a chance of getting its representatives into the city government. If all parties are bad, vote for the least bad option. Chances are the worst option already has an army of pensioners voting for them, so if you don't vote, you'll get the worst option automatically. If you do vote, however, you might get the less bad option, which is still better than the worst. It's important to take every chance not just at making things better, but at making things less worse if needed. Streets only get torn up and rebuilt once every 30 years, if that, so we only get one shot at making meaningful changes to a given public space, so we we better make sure we maximize positive changes, or, if that's not an option, that we minimize
minimize negative changes. For example, on a more personal note, I got a lot of criticism for telling people to vote for the German Green Party. I was told the Greens are not great, they are not perfect, and they did bad things in the past, etc. Well, congratulations. In the last local election in Berlin, less people showed up to vote for the Greens, so the Conservatives got into power, whose first enacted measure was to immediately put all bike path projects on hold and then try and erase some existing bike paths. The Greens aren't perfect, but they're still a lot better than the alternative. And if you want to treat politics like a purity test, an empty virtue signal, where you refuse to vote for the lesser of two evils, because a political party has to be a perfect representation of all your important inner values, congratulations. For your incisive political insight and mature behavior, you'll get to be the smuggest person to die under the wheels of a pickup truck on the side of the road that used to be a bike lane. So yeah, politics is always a lesser of two evils game. And now that we seem to be passing peak automobile, it is our job to make the most of this situation via strategic voting. A future of calm, safe, human-centric, car-free cities is definitely possible and it seems like we're moving towards that future. At least young people are. However, it is and it will continue to be an uphill battle. It will never just happen on its own as the car has some powerful friends. In the developed world, billions are spent on lobbying for car centrism. Ever wondered why all those far-right people suddenly started protesting 15-minute cities of all things, calling it communism, a surveillance dystopia, thinking people will be confined to their neighborhoods or something? This was in large part an astroturfing, meaning fake grassroots campaign by the fossil fuel industry. Wow, do you think they would do that? Try to sabotage a project that represents a threat to their profit margins? We discussed this issue at length on the Urbanist Agenda podcast with Not Just Bikes, by the way. Feel free to check it out, the link is below. In summary, in the fight for more livable and human-centric cities, we seem to have gained some headway via young people becoming more car-free, mostly due to economic circumstances. And if we want to get as far away from possible from the corporate car-centric dystopia, like Houston, to make sure we really are past peak automobile, and to finally break free of automobile realism, we must make sure that these positive changes are made permanent. And we can do that by voting for the party or parties in local elections that aren't in the pocket of car companies and that want to take public space away from metal boxes and give it back to the people. Or if that doesn't work, then just the lesser of two evils. Simple as that. And I thank you for watching. If you like my content, consider supporting me on Patreon, link in the description. And I'll be seeing you next time.